Uh, it, is a, it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Pradeep Gokhale, who is a professor who is an adjunct professor of Buddhism and Pali studies at the University of Pune. He's had a long and distinguished career, focused very significantly on Buddhist logic and Nyaya and the permeation of Nyaya across different traditions. In his very detailed resume that I'm reading from, there are publications having to do, deal with Buddhist Nyaya, of course, Jain Nyaya, and of course, the Vedic, the Hindu traditions of Nyaya, and many other topics besides. Today he will speak on Buddhism and Nyaya, which will provide a very interesting perspective for us to really understand how pervasive this methodology was. And it's also important to note that Buddhism was the vehicle. It was not Jainism or Hinduism, which were largely, I should say, I shouldn't say exclusively, but largely restricted to the Indian subcontinent. There were Hindu kingdoms, of course, we know in Southeast Asia. But really, the vehicle for the global propagation of Indian methods of thought and Indian culture was Buddhism. And so in that context, his remarks uh, acquire additional salience because it was this flavor of Nyaya that went to Central Asia and then was taken over by the Arabs and then through them by the Europeans. So it is with special interest that we will listen to you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Sidenji and all the scholars. Uh, so I have just written a paper. Maybe uh, it's uh, on the flat title is the Nagarama KT approach to reality and knowledge. In juxtaposition with Nyaya. Uh, because although I am talking about Dinaya and Dhammakirti, my main focus will be on Dhammakirti. Uh, Indian philosophy has developed through darshanas, which are popularly called schools or systems of Indian philosophy. In Western philosophy, we talk of metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics as branches of philosophy. Indian philosophy is not divided in that way. However, every darshan has its own epistemology, that is theory of Prama, theology, theory of Pramit, and axiology, the perspective on values, that is Purushas. When the Buddha presented his worldview and also his views about mind and knowledge, the Vaisheshika worldview and Nyaya epistemology were not in currency. But from the first century, Vaisheshika system emerged as a systematic ontology, and Nyaya emerged as an epistemological and logical system. These systems presented a model of ontological and epistemological categories for other philosophical traditions to follow. In fact, Nyaya since its inception was largely consistent with Vaisheshika ontology. When Buddhism developed as a systematic philosophy, it had twofold reaction against this realist Nyaya. First reaction came from Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna, in his Vigraha Vyavartini, rejected the notions of Praman and Prameh. Similarly, he criticized Nyaya Sutra, particularly Uddesha and Lakshana section of Nyaya Sutra in his work, Vedalya Sutra. Nagarjuna criticized Nyaya from a non essentialist or emptiness point of view. This criticism was entirely against the spirit of Nyaya. The second reaction was from Dignaya Dharmakirti school. Dignaya and Dharmakirti did not reject the basic framework of Pramana and Pramana, that is, to knowledge and objection. 
but they differ with which a school on the nature of ontological reality and with nyaya on the nature and types of knowledge. What's the point of difference between nyaya vishayika school and dina dharmakirti school? Dina and dharmakirti were not anti-essentialist like Nagarjuna, but they were advocates of impermanence and anti-substantialist view. Lady Anityata and Anathmata. Here I am taking Anathmata in the broad sense of non substantiality rather than no school theory. Yanavishishka system, on the other hand, advocated eternality and substantiality in many ways. For understanding the difference clearly, we can consider common sense beliefs as a focal point. There are some basic beliefs which all of us share. I exist as a sentient being. There are other sentient beings. There is the material world consisting of material elements. Things are and happen in space and time. We use words for talking about the world. These and such beliefs are basic to what is termed variously as Vyavahar, Loka Vyavahar, Samruti, Loka Samruti, or uh, Loka Samruti Satya. All philosophical systems have to accept them in one way or the other. But the question is how you approach them. I want to suggest that there is an important difference between the approaches of the two schools as we are talking about. Nyaya Vaisheshtika has an eternalist and substantialist approach, whereas the Nagadharma Kirti school has a critical and phenomenalist approach to these beliefs. Now, let us consider these two approaches in some details. Let us take the first common sense belief and a sentient being. Nyaya Vaisheshtika make, make it substantial by saying that I exist as an eternal substance called Atma. Similarly, the existence of others also refers to the existence of other eternal substantial divatmans. This divatman operates with the help of another substance called manas and sense organs which are made of substances with the help of which it produces consciousness in itself. The material world also consists of material substances, either is an eternal material substance. Other changing material substances are also the composite poles, awayavis, made from the eternal atoms. Time and space, which provide the framework for our existence, are also eternal substances. For Jnana Vishishika, just as substances are real, their properties are also real. Truly speaking, the reality of Jnana Vishishika has substance property structure where substances are the loki and properties are located in them. The properties include qualities, motions, relations, peculiarities, realization, and universal samadhi. At a later stage, absences are also included in this list. Nyaya Vaisheshika regarded most of these substances and properties as existent, that is sub, objects of knowledge, that is familiar, and denotations of words that is behave. Vaisheshika believed that all the six categories, namely substance, quality, motion, universals, and uh, particularity, uh, sorry, particularity and inherence, all seven categories with the addition of absence, give a mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive picture of the world by treating all entities as existent, knowable, and Denotations of words, Yahweh Sheshika are located isomorphism between reality, knowledge, and language. Among these six or seven categories, universals play an important role as identity conferring factor. Things are what they are because of universals. A part is a part because of partners and so on. With the exception of six obstructions of universal, obstructors of universal, that is Jati Jati Madhakas, these universals are supposed to be eternal, eternal reals. Another important part of our common sense beliefs is the fact that we communicate with others. 
we can impart knowledge through language. We can make true statements and point out falsehood of false statements. Nyaya Shishikar explained this commonly accepted fact of language in terms of the alleged isomorphism between reality, knowledge, and language. The bond between language and reality is another important feature of Nyaya Shishikar ontology. Accordingly, whatever is expressed in language refers to something in reality, and whatever is there in reality is expressible in language. Nyaya Shishikar wrote that the words actually refer to the objects of the world. This word meaning relation is sometimes conferred on words by God, sometimes by humans. This substantialist, eternalist, and language-bound approach to reality was not acceptable to Buddhism, particularly the Dhimnagar Dharmapiti school. So let us see how the approach of this school was non-eternalist, non-substantialist, and not non-language bound. Though Buddhists did not deny the existence of I in its minimal empirical sense, they regarded it as a combination of I aggregates or as a mind series. They denied the, its existence as a permanent Atman. Like oneself as a mind continuum, Dharmakirti in his work, Sandhananda Siddhi argued that other mind continua also exist. Dignaya and Dharmakirti, in their realist stance, accepted matter, but they analyzed matter not as made of four or five substances, but only as the combinations of sensible phenomena. Sometimes they also accepted atoms. But unlike the atoms of Vaisheshikas, they were not permanent. For Vaisheshikas, Janukas are impermanent because they can be broken into Paramanus. But Paramanus cannot be broken and they are permanent. For Vignar and Dhamkirti, breakability is not the criterion of impermanence of a thing. If a thing is a cause of something, then it must be impermanent. Since atoms cause the combinations, they are impermanent. But whether gross objects are combinations, uh, are combinations of sensible phenomena, or invisible atoms, they do not exist as component forms, that is, as a way of being. and Dharmakirti did not accept Akasha as a positive substance. <laughs> or even big, but probably as a negative entity, as a vacuum in which things exist. They accepted time not as an eternal substance, but as a, as a concept useful for explaining momentariness. While explaining the function of language, Dignar and Dharmakirti do not accept any real relation between words and objects. They convey, uh, sorry, words convey mental constructs not real objects. Though, uh, through the theory of accord, exclusion, they insisted that the words only exclude the things from other things. They do not directly refer to the things. All conventions about word meaning relation are human made. Uh, there is no divine convention, speaker's intention or vivaksha, rather than referential meaning plays a pivotal role in, in, in interpersonal communication. Now we come to the nature of reality according to Dharmakirti. The approach of the Ignata Dharmakirti school probably uh, more closely uh, was probably more closely related to Buddha's original insight on reality and knowledge as compared to Nagarjuna. In the Buddha's approach to reality, seeing the things as they are, Yatha Buddha was for Darshana, was, a crucial, was of crucial importance. At a secular level, even in perception, uh, it distinguished between what is directly given and what is mentally constructed. It distinguished between, uh, sorry, uh, this was suggested by Buddha by distinguishing between visual perception and mental perception of blue in the following words. 
In this statement, the first reference to Neela is about the unique particular, that is Neela Swarakana. The second reference to it as Neelam Iti is about the universal view on the concept of it. Dhanokethi also in the Hetu Bindu mentioned these two kinds of objects as Neela Swarakshan and Neela Vikalpasya Vishaya. What the Buddha calls Manovitnya idea was called Kalpana or Vikalpa, that is mental construction by Dignaga and Dhanokethi. Dignaga and Dhanokethi in their ontology regarded all evaluation category as mental constructs. The perception devoid of mental construction was regarded as perfection Praman by the Mahavira. According to Dharmakirti, what is given in such non-constructive cognition is selection. Selection, very unique particular, is uh, selection of the basic particulars that constitute the real world. The blue object as a unique particular is given directly. However, when you call it as blue, you apply the name blue or the concept of blue to it. Seeing the thing as blue is mentally constructing it. According to Dhammakirti, Swalakshana exist independently of knowledge. They are the objects of our direct cognition. Dhammakirti refers to this type of cognition as sensation type of cognition or alochana or perception is perception. So selectionas are like sense data in that they are directly given in the sensation. But while there cannot be unsensed sense data, there can be unsensed selections. It is more appropriate therefore to compare selections with sensibilia rather than with sensa or sense data. Though a selection can remain unsensed, it cannot remain idle. It, it must always have some function or the other. In fact, according to the Dharmakirti, to be real is to be functional, Arthak Kriya Sahaja. A thing without a concrete function, that is Arthak Kriya, is nothing. It is according to him like a monster, a hair fall. This peculiar conception of what is real is Dharmakirti, which is talking of momentary. This being real means having a function, and since everything which has function must itself change while performing its function, everything real must change. Secondly, if functionality and hence change is the very nature, the so how of the real thing, a real thing cannot remain unchanged even for a moment. So it must be changing at every moment. And since, according to the a thing cannot change and still remain the same, a changing thing cannot retain its identity. So, Dhammakirti claims a real thing must lose its identity in the succeeding moment. Dhammakirti developed this kind of argument in his work, Hetu Bindu. It is interesting to note that Dhammakirti develops his, uh, his doctrine of momentariness in terms of Swabha. Self nature, or even the other essence. Here, unlike Nagarjuna, the Dhammakirti seems to be accepting a form of Swagavavada, that is essentialism, the doctrine of own nature. But accepting Swagavavada does not lead Dhammakirti to an eternalistic position. Rather, it helps him to develop his non eternalism. This is possible because Dhammakirti's concept of sub real is not that of something static, but rather that of something dynamic. And because Dhammakirti's essentialism is not metaphysical essentialism, but logical essentialism, Dhammakirti attaches such great importance to selection that he calls it Paramartha Sat, real in dimension. In this context, by Paramartha Sat, it does not mean a transcendent reality is or something which transcends the realm of experience and mundane practice. The unique particulars are on the contrary 
empirical in that they are directly given in a sensation type of position. They are practical in that each one of them has a criteria, a concrete function, which is directly relevant to our practical aspirations. When we are thirsty, for example, we need a particular and tangible sample of water and not waterness. The idea of water or the universal water. The idea of water does not quench our thirst. So the idea of water, no matter how vivid and clear it may be, is not good. This is very clear in Dharmakirti's thinking. This also indicates that Dharmakirti was not basically an idealist, but a realist of the time. A question is raised in this context whether Dharmakirti can be called a consistent external realist. That is because Dharmakirti in his works, Pramana Vinishtaya and Pramana Vartika, presents some arguments for inseparable relation between an object and its consciousness, that is Neil and Neil V. His position in this text, particularly in Pramana Vartika, oscillates between external realism and so that is the Sautrantic position and idealism of yoga. However, uh, it cannot be shown that Dhammakirti's ultimate position is idealism and that he has, uh, and that he accepts realism only at conventional level. Dharmakirti must have been attracted to both the positions for different reasons. He was attracted to idealism from a critical point of view when he was critical about the limitations of Sautrantic idealism, uh, which itself, the Sautrantic position itself, can be called critical realism. He was attracted to realism for its capacity to explain the diverse phenomena and lead human beings to their goals. External realism seems to be his mainstream position, whereas idealism seems to be an island which he enters intermittently. Actually, quenches our thirst is thus the water particular, but the water particular being unique is not properly represented by the boer water, which is common to all water particulars. However, we do call it water. By doing so, we hide its unique nature and identify the thing in terms of some shareable aspect of it. The shareable aspect, that is the universal, is not real in the sense in which a particular is real, but reference to a universal becomes necessary because we cannot understand the particular, nor can we talk about it without reference to a universal. So, what we actually drink is particular water and not universal water, when we go to drink water, we do not do so because it is a unique particular, but because it is water. It is water like the water I drank before, and it will satisfy my present thirst because similar water in the past satisfied the similar thirst of the similar eye. This is the kind of understanding implicit in our going to drink the water particular in this way. Our actual practice with regard to water becomes possible through our understanding, which involves the employment of universals. Uh, we face the world of particulars by mapping it on the map of universals and thus by making, making it meaningful. Now we come to the you know, epistemology, which means that of Nyan. So first, I will talk about the concept of knowledge. Uh, in Sanskrit, the word praman, which is derived from the word pratasma, has two meaning. Uh, one, true cognition, that is knowledge, and two, means to true cognition, that is means to knowledge. In early Nyaya literature, we find uh, the word praman used in both ways. For instance, Sometimes medical perception is called the picture command. Sometimes a sense organ, which is a means to medical perception, uh, is regarded as the picture command. But with the development of their epistemology, uh, Nayaikas distinguish more sharply between what they call Prama, and that is knowledge, and Praman, that is means to knowledge. They rather define Praman as means to knowledge, Praman Karan Praman. 
in order to understand the Nyaya conception of knowledge, that is Brahma, one has to distinguish between uh, presentative cognition, that is Anubhava, and recollection, that is Smriti. This distinction was important for my idea because they, like the philosophers of many other schools, did not want to give the status of knowledge to memory. Of course, the exception being Jainism, as we saw in the morning. Indian epistemologists generally held that one can claim to be knowing something only when one is cognizing it afresh or anew. If one is remembering which one has already known before, then one cannot be said to be knowing it at that time. Hence, Nayaika defined Brahma as the true presentative of that is Yathartha Anubhava. Here, Yathartha means true. Literally, Yathartha means in accordance with the object, Yathartha. This implies that Nayaikas are accepting correspondence theory of truth. One more point relevant for Nyaya conception of truth is that when Nyayakas talk of truth or falsehood of a concept of a cognition, they have in mind qualification, qualified structure, the shape can be shaped of type of structure of cognition, uh, of cognition as well as reality. Though they do not officially grant that cognition itself has a form that is called Nyaya Sakar. Uh, uh, the object of cognition, according to them, has a structure or a form. Uh, if the structure of the object of cognition tallies with the structure of reality, the cognition is said to be true, otherwise false. As I have suggested, the structure of the object and also of reality can be expressed in terms of qualification and qualified, that is, rejection and rejection, or property and property where dharma and dharma. Our cognitions are of the form A is so and so, which means A is qualified by being so and so. For example, let us suppose that there is a piece of silver before me and I have the cognition of the form this is silver, which means that this thing is qualified by silverness. Uh, this is a true cognition according to Nyaya because the, struct the structure of the um, object and the cognition tally with each other. If, on the other hand, there is a concept before me, but I have the cognition of the form this is silver, it is a false cognition because there is discrepancy between cognition and the fact. The property bearer, this is common to both the cognition and corresponding fact. The error lies in the cognition of the property. In my cognition, this is qualified by silverness, when this is, in fact, qualified by uh, constants. Now, let us consider how the Buddhist conception of Pramana deviates from that of Nyaya. As we have seen, Nyaya regards Pramana as a means of, or instrument, that is, Karana of cognition. Nyayaikas here are following the model of agent, action, and instrument. According to this model, Atman is the agent who produces knowledge uh, as its own property by using the instrument called Pramana. Atman, knowing an object by using Praman, is like a carpenter cutting wood for, by using a saw. Buddhists do not accept this model of knowledge production as they do not accept Atman. According to Buddhists, consciousness arises from many causal conditions. The types of causes with the The types of causes which are which the Buddhists accept do not include agent or instrument. So, although the Buddhists do not discard the notion of pramana as a means to knowledge, the distinction between knowledge and its means is only virtual and not real according to them. The same knowledge episode has both the aspects, means aspect and end aspect according to them. Another difference emerges from this. According to Nyal, even an insentient thing can be a means to knowledge. For example, in the case of perceptual cognition, they regard sense or as Pramana. This is not acceptable to Buddhists. Pramana, according to them, 
does not lead to the knowledge of the object, but it itself illuminates thought. And only knowledge can be from our according to that. The third point on which the Buddhist concept of Pramana deviates from the Nyaya. The Nyaya concept is that the Nyaya concept of Pramana is homogeneous, whereas the Buddhist concept of Pramana is heterogeneous. According to Nyaya, there can be a common definition of Pramana which equally applies to all Pramanas. The criterion of the of correspondence can be applied equally to all types of knowledge. However, according to Buddhists, Though both perception and inference are part knowledge that is subject jnana or brahman, they can be called so in distinct ways. In Buddhism, it is not possible to find a definition of brahman which applies to both perception and inference exactly in the same way. For example, the Dharmakirti defines brahman as avisamvadi jnana. Avisamvadi means non discordant. Instead of using the positive term concordant, Dharmakirti uses a negative expression in order to indicate that every type of knowledge does not have direct concordance, that is correspondence with the author. We can only expect that it should not be discordant with the author. Perception directly arises from the object, but inference is related to the object in a remote way. Buddhists also regard Prapakattva is a defining feature of Pramana. Prapakattva means that it takes one to the real object. Again, the two Pramanas are not Prapakattva in the same way. Perception directly makes the object external. Of course, the object which causes the perceptual cognition and the object which is obtained through the cognition are same only in the sense that they belong to the same causal series. Inference is directly about a universal, but a universal has no ontological reality. So an inference can lead to or direct the knower towards a real object only in a remote way. Hence the Buddhist definition of Praman does not apply to the same types of knowledge homogeneously, but this is not a part of the Buddhist, rather Buddhists are suggesting that the concept of knowledge is itself not a precise and uniform concept heterogeneity is inbuilt in it, or it is intrinsic. Another doctrine which follows from the heterogeneity of the concept of Pramana is the doctrine of discriminativeness of Pramanas, that is the uh, uh, Pramana Viplo of Pramana Vyavas. Accordingly, the two Pramanas, namely perception and inference, have two types of objects. Perception can grasp only a particular and inference can grasp only a universal. They cannot share each other's objects. Uh, this view is contrasted with the Nyaya view, which holds a sharing of objects by Pramanas. Accordingly, the same object, which is which its particularity and universality can be grasped by perception, inference, as well as verbal testimony. So this conception of knowledge in this way deviates from the Nyaya conception. Most of them are primarily concerned with empirical knowledge as a point of departure. Nyaya models its notion of knowledge of Vaisheshikarjanism, which involves, as I have suggested before, substantialization and even internalization of objects of knowledge, uh, uh, sorry, objects of common sense and projection of reality on ordinary language. Buddhism, on the other hand, aims at critically deconstructing or uh, critically analyzing uh, common sense and ordinary language. Now, uh, we come to the particular pramana that uh, perception the concept of perception, perception. Akshapada Gautama, the author of Nyaya Sutra, defined mm -hmm. perception, that is, perceptual knowledge and the combination which arises from the contact between sense organs and objects, which is non-verbal, non ring and is determinate in nature. This definition was debated by Buddhist position. They asked whether sense-object contact is a necessary condition of each type of perception. 
particularly it was asked no sense object contact is possible in the case of visual and auditory perception when the respective objects are removed from the senses. This led to the theory uh, that some sense organs are apraptyakari, that is, they cause perception without reaching out to their respective objects. The Buddhist epistemologists, such as the Imam and Dharmakirti, were mainly critical about the determinative character of perception. They distinguish between non judgmental that is, non determinative perception, non determinative, uh, as a cognition, and judgmental that is, determinative cognition, that is, there's a nirvikalpaka and savikalpaka jnana. Direct knowledge, which is the same as perceptual knowledge, must be non judgmental in nature. The uh, non judgmental cognition can be called true or samyak according to the realist Buddhist, particularly through Trantikas, because the cognition is caused by the object and assumes the form of the object as it is. The judgmental cognition which follows the non judgmental one is not true as it involves mental or conceptual constructs, that is, vikalpa. Uh, which are superimposed on what is directly given. Under the influence of Buddhism, the Yayakas also had to accept non judgmental perception, but they conceived it differently. According to them, non judgmental perception just provides the raw material for the judgmental perception. In itself, it is neither true nor false. The judgmental perception can be true or false. The concepts involved in the judgmental perception are not mental constructs according to Nayaika, they are two reflections of uh, reality according to that. Now we come to inference, the Yaidanama. Though inferential knowledge is understood as indirect knowledge, it is not uh, independent of perception. The term Anuman means the cognition that is man which takes place after it is anu perception. Here, uh, Gautama in Nyaya Sutra having defined perception, defined Anumana as Tatpurvakam, that is preceded by that, that is preceded by perception. Uh, now we uh, come to the distinction between uh, Swarthama and Pararthama, that is inference for oneself and inference for others. Swarthama is the inferential knowledge or indirect knowledge that occurs to oneself. When one wants to convince the other person of the inferential knowledge which oneself has, one has to present an argument. Uh, though the distinction was suggested in the Ayah Sutra through the separate mention of Anumana as Pramana and Avayava as a separate category, Buddhist logician Dignada, in his theorization of inference, made the distinction explicit in the form of. Anuman for oneself and Anuman for others. So, Anuman for our karma. Out of the two, Anuman for others has the form of an argument. But Anuman for oneself does not necessarily have the form of an argument. Anuman for oneself is of the nature of knowledge, and hence it is the basic form of Anuman Prama. For Nyaya, the two processes are parallel or isomorphic in nature. Uh, I mean, I have here uh, on a table, uh, uh, here is, uh, one column is Swarthanuman and the other is Swarthanuman. So what are the steps in Swarthanuman and what are the steps in Swarthanuman? So the first step in Swarthanuman is Pratidnya. And corresponding to that, there is no step in Swarthanuman. Because in Swarthanuman, we are not supposed to know what they are already, they are going to do. The second step in Swarthanuman is uh, rather, the first step in Swarthanumana is Hetudhyan, perception of smoke on the hill. And the second step in Parathanumana is the statement of Hetu, because there is smoke on the hill. Then the second step in Swarthanumana is Vyapti Smarana, that is, recollection of the invariable smoke by relation. Uh, in Parathanumana, the first step is Udharana, that is, wherever there is smoke, there is fire like in the kitchen. Yeah, the third step in Swarthanumana is Paramanita, that is the cognition of smoke on the hill 
as permitted by and the fourth step in para parallel fourth step in Paratharma is Upanayana, and which is of the form the smoke on the hill is pervaded by the fire. And lastly, in Swarthama, Swarthama, the last step is Anumiti, you know, which is the influential cognition of fire on the hill, and the corresponding step in Paratharma is called Nigamana, so uh, it takes the form, therefore, there is fire on the hill. According to Dignar and also Dramukirti, on the other hand, the two types of inference, that is Pantarma and Paratarma, are related by causal relation, but they are neither parallel nor reciprocal. Dignar's systematization of Nyaya inference. Now, inferential knowledge, as understood by Gautama, refers to the cognitive passage from seen to unseen. This passage is based on similarity and dissimilarity with seen cases, for example, the knowledge of fire on the hill from the smoke, seen there is based on similarity with the kitchen, where both smoke and fire are seen together, and the similarity uh, with the lake, where both are absent together. Uh, Vatsyayana, the early commentator of Nyaya Sutra, defined inferential knowledge as based on the relation between the sign and the signified, that is linger and lingin, or but uh, what is the direction of this relation? Is it from sign to signify, or uh, it is uh, rather from sign to the signified and not vice versa? Where sign is available, signified property also should be available. But it is not expected that where signified property is available, sign should also be available. Smoke cannot exist without fire, but fire can exist without smoke. Dignaga, in his systematization of inference, introduced the notions of paksha, that is dharmin, where sadhya dharma is to be true, sapaksha, the set of similar cases, and vipaksha, the set of dissimilar cases, that is the cases where the sadhya dharma is absent. By using these terms, uh, Dignaga presented his people character theory of Guruhetu. Similarly, he expounded the wheel of Hethus, which consisted of nine different possibilities in which a good or bad Hethu could be existent or non-existent in Sapaksha and Vipaksha. He replaced the Nyaya model of five-step argument by the model of three elements of proof, that is Paksha, Hethu, and Drishtanda. This is reason and instance, and developed a theory of their respective fallacies. That is, fallacies of Paksha, fallacies of Ketu, and fallacies of Rishtanga. Uh, Dignaga's systematization of inference have, are leading consequences on the further development of Indian law. Other systems develop their theories of inference either by adopting or by criticizing or by modifying Dignaga's theory. Nayaikas augmented the list of three characteristics by two more characteristics, that is, non falsification of the thesis by uh, the mean, that is, Abhadita Vishayatu, and non availability of the counter argument, that is, Asat Pratikoshatu. Dharmakirti, the grand disciple of Dhinna, in his Hitu Bindu, rejected such an, uh, such an emendation of Dhinna doctrine of Dhinna doctrine of people character of Hitu. However, he himself reconstructed the theory of triple character through his reinterpretation. Dharmakirti incorporated the notions of universality and necessity in the theory of triple character Hitu. Dharmakirti insisted that the necessary relation between Hitu and Sarge is possible uh, in either of the two ways, identity and causality. This closed concept uh, of necessi necessary relation was not acceptable uh, or not accepted by other systems. However, the notion of universal pervasion as the basis of inference was accepted by all the schools of Indian philosophy except Java. It can be seen from the foregoing discussion that Dharmakirti's ontology and epistemology do not match with each other perfectly. In reality, there are entities of only one kind, uh, that is the uh, uh, Swalakshana, 
in each particular whereas the knowledge through which we reach them is of two kinds perception and inference out of which only one kind of knowledge reaches the reality directly uh, that is by perception this heterogeneous relation between knowledge and reality is made manageable by the by the concept of how things are ultimately unique particulars they present themselves that is their nature so hard to us in two ways the nature that we directly apprehend and the nature that we determine it is interesting to see how the concept of swabhav operates in dharma kirti ontology and epistemology uh, the role of the concept of swabhav in dharma kirti ontology and epistemology dharma kirti reality uh, in its ultimate sense, that is, Ramana Sasa is uh, Swalakshana. Here, Swalakshana means something which is by its very nature unique. This means that something real is what it is and does not share anything with anything else. Here, the concept of Sohav is applied to Antal. Although unique particulars do not share any common properties with anything else, when we determine their nature, in thought and talk about them, we do so in terms of their common properties, which are merely mental constructs that uh, we happen to impose upon them. Thus, the judgmental perception, inference, and linguistic presentations, uh, in them we are dealing with objects as they are identified or determined by universals. But dealing with objects as they are identify all determined uh, sorry uh, but uh, what is the function of these universals it is ultimately to determine the self nature of the objects so dharma kirti observes because all objects by their self nature have fixed essences and are excluded from things of their kind and from those of other kinds therefore the different universals are constructed depending upon the objects from which the things are to be excluded. In this way, the notion of how primarily applicable to things could be extended to classes of In other words, when we are dealing with any particular, we are dealing with its nature, there is how which is excluded from the nature of similar as well as dissimilar objects. That is Sajatiya, Vijatiya, Vyavrutta. When on the other hand, we are dealing with Samanya Lakshan, we are dealing with the nature of the subject, of, of the object, the Sohava of the object, which is excluded from dissimilar objects only. This is how the notion of Sohava becomes immediately uh, associated with the theory of exclusion, that is opposed. Dharmakirti also explains the nature and types of inference in terms of Sohava. Through the inference, we come to know one thing on the basis of or knowledge of the other thing, or we come to know an aspect of one thing on the basis of uh, another aspect of the same thing. This becomes possible when there is a necessary relation between what we come to know, that is probandum, and on the, that on the basis of the knowledge of which we come to know it, that is proven, that is our guarantee. This necessary relation becomes necessary if it is essential, that is, if it is rooted in the essence or swabhavas of things. In the Hetu Bindu, Dharma Kirti classifies Hetu into three kinds, that is swabhava, karya, and anukalati, and shows how the necessary relation, uh, that is vyapti, involved in uh, inferences uh, based on these Hetus is explainable in terms of swabhava, that is, how vyapti should be based on swabhava pratibandha. Uh, so, first type is inference from Swabhava Hetu. According to Dharma Kirti, the uh, Swabhava of a thing is uniform. It is not divisible into parts, but it may have many aspects which can be specified with the help of universals. Some of these aspects are necessarily related to uh, each other in such a way that when it's pervaded, vyapta by another. Uh, this simply means that the rule of the form Wherever there is one that is pervaded aspect, there is the other aspect that is pervaded aspect. 
uh, in such cases, the pervaded aspect can be inferred from the pervaded aspect. For instance, the part is real and whatever is real is impermanent. Therefore, the part is impermanent. This is the impermanent. Here, realness and impermanence are the two aspects of the uniform self-nature of the real thing, such that realness is pervaded by impermanence. Then we come to Karya Hetu, there is a difference uh, from uh, effect as the performance of the Hetu. Uh, a thing has a particular nature of its own. How does this particular nature come about? It comes about due to the particular nature of its cause. One could say, for instance, that a smoke is what it is because of the particular nature of its cause, namely fire. So, if there is smoke on the mountain, there must be fire. In this way, the inference of a cause from its effect can also be explained in terms of self nature of things. Inference from Anupala theory the self nature of a thing has two aspects. It determines what the thing is and also what it is not. To understand the self nature of a thing is to understand both these aspects. To understand what the thing is not, uh, that is to understand a negative fact about the thing is to understand the otherness, that is mutual absence, that is anyanya bhavanya terminology of the thing from other things. A negative fact is in this way reducible to otherness, which in turn is an aspect of swabhava of the thing. This negative aspect of the swabhava could be known directly through perception or indirectly through inference by an local of behavior. In this way, an inference based on an local of behavior can be explained in terms of how. The logical essential is about on the background of the above considerations, uh, the following question arises uh, regarding Dharma Kirti's concept of Sohav. What is Dharma Kirti's concept of Sohav? The same as the popular concept of Sohav, which is that of the, an essence. If no, how was it different? According to the popular concept of Sohav, it is self nature or own nature or the essence of a thing. Sohav of a thing makes the thing what it is. It is therefore supposed that somehow is something which can never change. We, for instance, say that it is the very nature of fire to burn. Fire will not be fire if it does not burn. This understanding and the notion of somehow is sometimes employed for establishing a kind of eternalism. The argument for eternalism takes the following form. Nothing can transcend its own nature. So if something is real, then by its very nature, it cannot cease to be real. Hence, reality or any real thing for that matter, which is real by its own nature, by its very nature, must always be real and therefore eternal. Here, it is interesting to compare Ramakirti's response to this argument with Nagarjuna's. Nagarjuna, in his response to eternalism, rejected Swabhava and developed his doctrine of Shunya. Dharma Kirti, however, did not think it necessary to reject Swabhava altogether in order to combat eternalism. He accepted Swabhava but avoided its least consequence, namely eternalism. This becomes possible in Dharma Kirti's framework because he accepts Swabhava in its logical sense and not in its metaphysical sense. So, how rather in its logical sense takes the form of the law of identity and double negation. Hence, everything has its own nature, which makes the thing what it is. Amongst the saying, everything is said that it is what it is. Or more simply and symbolically, all A is A. The other side of the same coin is something has its own nature on account of which the things become different from everything else. This amounts to saying everything is said that it is other than what it is not. Or more simply and symbolically, all A is not not A. The doctrine of Swabhava understood in this way does not refer to any metaphysically fixed or eternal status, uh, eternal nature of a thing. Swabhava 
can be called logical essentialism in this sense. So we have seen in the first part of this paper that Nagarjuna was not ready to accept even the logical form of the, I mean, sorry, uh, elsewhere I have argued much here, that he was not ready to accept even logical form of essentialism. In Madhyamaka Shastra, he rejects even those statements which in the instantiate the logical law of identity. Dharmakirti, on the other hand, seems to suggest that such statements are of self-identity are redundant because they are obvious or self-evident. They really exhibit the true truth of logical essentialism. In this way, Dharmakirti explains the logical law of identity and double negation as expressions of logical essentialism. He points out in the Getubindu that when we judge something to be what it is, we exclude it from what it is not, and through the same judgment, we exclude the third possibility. That is, the third possibility is the, uh, it can be understood as uh, the law of excluded middle or the law of non contradiction. That is, the thing can be both itself and the other, or neither itself nor the other. We can say in a nutshell that the Hanukkah was aware that our judgments concerning things in the world follow the laws of logic because everything has its swabhav. In this way, the Hanukkah seems to explain the laws of logic in terms of swabhav. This is how logic and ontology are inseparably related through the notion of swabhav in the Hanukkah scheme. This logic is also inseparably related to its epistemology because it is in the context of the theory of the mind that the laws of logic can be discussed meaningfully. The doctrine of Sohrav also had an implication for the Hanukkah's explanation of emancipation. According to him, emancipation is possible because of the self nature of mind. In the Pramana article, he discusses what, uh, what is natural and what is accidental to the human mind, that is Vijnana or Chit. Apprehending an object as it is, is the nature of consciousness. But it deviates from its own nature due to some uh, external, external factors. Similarly, illumination is, is the very nature of the mind. The impurities are accidental. So with this, I thought I don't know. So, so the floor is now open to questions. So you have to follow one. Yes. I want to know what is the difference between so how of Bhagavad Gita, so how Madhya and Puchyate, so how, then in Siddhartha Tarupanishad, the other so how will need to be the child, and then your so how. So what is the difference between, and your means I so how. What is the difference between these three terms? The second, you said that consciousness arises in certain context or circumstance. What is the difference between the consciousness of Charvak, consciousness of Nyaya, and consciousness of Bhutanism? To include also consciousness of Bhutanism. Mm. Now, about Shavala, as you pointed out, the word. Terms of how the concept of how has been used in different systems in different ways. And uh, the purpose is again different every time. So, when in the Gita's way, it is said, the non changing character has been emphasized there. Whereas, Dharma Kirti is not saying that Prabhava implies non changing character of anything. And Prabhava just means own nature. That's all. That own nature itself can change rather than first change. Change is intrinsic to it. 
<laughs> and secondly, when, uh, for example, Karvaka, the clean that they are so how uh, then uh, everything arises from so how uh, uh, also, I think similar idea. Yeah. So, how we need to So, some people say that things arise from so how. Uh, now, there the idea is that the idea is mainly to deny the uh, other possible causes. Ishura Karanava, then, for example, Charvaka say that things arise from so how. I doubt whether they are denying causation as such. They are denying the Ishura Karanava. That is, things do not arise from any such power as God and so on. Uh, they, they are natural. Natural. They arise natural. So we have But it changes his. <laughs> Sometimes he is <laughs> And now coming to this idea of the consciousness. Uh, now in Nyaya. Consciousness is a quality which arises in Atma. So in Buddhism as well as in consciousness is impermanent. And now only whether it exists for two moments or one moment, that is the point of view. Is it product? Yeah. Yes, it is a product. It arises from causes and effects. And uh, uh, the only thing is that in Nyaya system, it arises as a quality of Atman, which is the substance. So this Dravya and Guna model is essential. For uh, Buddhists, uh, Dharvaka is a kind of aggregate, they say. So it arises from immediately preceding consciousness. So there is a consciousness theory. And of course, other conditions also are there uh, from which consciousness arises. This record of itself, the of the card of perception is not a card. The card of perception is 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 so there is this idea of cognition of cognition. I have cognition of an object, and next moment I may have cognition or the cognition of the object. So do you think that you are talking about that? No. Now what do you mean by record? Stuti. No, memory. Memory. No, none of that. Okay. Memory. No, none of that. I think every mind, I have a mind on this group of this building, which records. Temperature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It could be machine or could be human. Yes. No, no. I mean, perception is a kind of cognition, it is a kind of consciousness. And if there is no consciousness element, in the record. Let's see, electronic recording machine. So it's recording temperature. It is not perception. What is it? Because perception and pranayi must be a kind of consciousness. It must be a kind of cognition. And who has is a valid source of knowledge? Yes. So when one is aware of that form, that record, that awareness of the record can be a kind of not. Perception, you know, the source of knowledge. It's kind of yeah. it can be called a prominence. Yes, when I read the record, yes, that is the source of knowledge. Yes, not the creation of the record. Yes, yes. But there is not perception when you read the record and get some knowledge. It's not perception. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of influence. Because it says only two perception and perception. Sir, you quoted one sentence. Mano Vijana and Nilam Vijana, the Nilam Vijana Vijana. So, as I still study the Hindu Dakarana, you want to translate that? Uh, the point is that I found this in Abhidharma Kosha. Yes, that, that's true. Uh, Four kinds of perception are accepted in Buddhism in the uh, 
Uh, one is uh, one of them is monomic gamma. And uh, uh, the definition I don't remember, but it is said that it is a complex type. But Samanantar Pratte Janitam Manovi Gyan. And here, uh, as I till now, as I understood, uh, this Manovi Gyan um, has its object the outside. And again, when you are saying Manovi Gyan in the Nilam Vijana, Nilam Kiti Chavijana, so it appears to me that the sense cognition which is produced indriya indriya gyan that indriya gyan is not swasambhya and the buddhist theory is that sarva chitta chaitanam atma samvedanam swasambhyam and this statement goes against that notion it appears to huh? what is your response uh, no my response is uh, actually uh, i mean in Whatever you find in Buddha's statements, the epistemology that Buddha was having in his mind, it is not the same as the, the later epistemology of Tigma and Nirvaji. Only I am suggesting that this particular distinction that we just observe Neel, but we do not cognize it as Neel. And at the next stage, we cognize it as Neel. This distinction is the, it could have been developed later. In the form of uh, nearly of cancer. So, so I'm not I'm not saying that this is no mithyana which uh, Buddha was talking about, that is in that statement yeah, is mentioned. It is the same as the uh monovidyana uh, of Dharma Kirti that is still. It is not the same. Okay. And second question that you um, explained. That similar first word crossed by similar water. So here, what kind of similarity is there in Buddhist philosophy? In the uh, no, this is still my further explanation. <laughs> because there is no ground for similarity at all. There is no ground for similarity at all. Always similarity is a mental construction. In Buddhist yeah. in, in, uh, So how this kind of experience is possible? Because we are cognizing something earlier, and now we are cognizing something completely different. There is no similarity available. We are not cognizing. So, uh, suppose I am seeing the water and I am going there, and I am seeing something else and I am going there. Both are similar in the way. Uh, mm, what is the status of similarity as a category? Is a very, I mean, how do you know it? How do you recognize it? So sometimes you directly see similarity. Yes. Those objects are before you. Yeah. I see the similarity between them also. Yeah. But when it is a chance, but very clearly observed that when we see four fingers, we also recognize the similarity and also dissimilarity. But this kind of observation is not possible in Buddhist philosophy. Yes. Yes. Similarity also will be a kind of samanya. Samanya. And not about one or similarity is a kind of samanya, and similarity is the source of the concept of samanya. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And the question is also there. You, uh, in according to the this philosophy, uh, non-judgmental cognition is always only the true cognition could be non-judgmental cognition. Okay, uh, judgmental cognition is a kind of construction. Okay, and you told that why it is true because it grasps the reality as it is. Is it? But how could we know that we are grasping the reality as it is? <laughs> this is the idea is criticism. Yeah, this is something like a basic presupposition of Sotrandic philosophy. But then this also indicates the limit of Sotrandic philosophy. That the, the cognition is cognized, we say that the cognition is cognized by the external object, but we never see directly the external object. That we, this uh, directly knowing itself means being caused by. Grayatva is uh, Kayatva. Ah. So, uh, say by very beautifully by Dharmakirti, 
the, those vikalpas are not there, mental constructs are not there on the animal side. You know? uh, and uh, then various issues, various problems which arise because of those vikalpas, they also do not arise in animal life. Uh, according to certain according to certain points of view, civilization, tools, machinery, technology, which has transformed our lives over many centuries in different ways. Some people think that they should leave our conceptual foundations of civilization and our philosophies and change. Others think that they need to be modified to include, to invent, to include our way of life, technologies, machinery, etc. Uh, we don't walk to Shimla. <laughs> Most of us. You may have to go back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, do Shimla. Not Shimla. We do both. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we saw Professor Jane earlier this morning. Did you see him? Uh, was it for seven years or not? How about we are in the world? World of the thousand years ago, the world of today. I'm going to debate that at this time. Are we just going to stay in our world today? That's not a question for you, actually. <laughs> One more thing. Since we believe in real so I think, uh, I mean, Buddha and Buddhists uh, insist on the role of mind, the, the, the basic uh, role of mind. So all the activities, creations of machines, and the use of machines, all these, uh, every time, these will start from our decision, our mental attitude. And that is, most important according to the internet. Internet. Yes, most. No, it, it's uh, this question of mind is very, very interesting. Uh, and it's microphone. The question of mind is very interesting. And uh, uh, all, almost all Indic religions believe in reincarnation you know, from one life to another, this kind of passage is there. So what happens to this kind of mind? Does it, you know, when it takes, suppose, oh, though I don't believe that we regress to animals, we keep from life to life as a human beings. Once we incarnate as human, we continue as humans. But, you know, in many traditions, it is believed that one can become another animal or something. So, you know, and then, what happens to you know the influence of the past life and the past mind over this uh, new mind which is actually the continuation of the past mind so uh, any speculation that is done uh, there are speculations are there mm -hmm. when you say mind theory at the end of the life and the mind uh, is called chuti chitta, the mind of uh, death, uh, death mind, at the, the mind which is at the time of death. That chuti chitta gives rise to the next mind, because mind series does not, uh, I mean, except uh, you are an arahat, the mind series will not stop at the time of the death. So that chuti chitta gives rise to pratisandhi chitta, pratisandhi chitta, which is the reverse consciousness. So uh, now, whether there is an intermediate, uh, say, passage of consciousness from death to rebirth or not, on that there are debates uh, among this. 
So, uh, in millions of pyro, he argues that it is not possible. So, I mean, there is no intermediate stage. Immediately after that, then uh, the next birth takes place. Uh, and of course, uh, so the causation, I mean, it is the, the consciousness that doesn't have to pass from one body to another. Immediately, it uh, comes into existence in the next body. So, um, uh, I mean, there are debates on that. And they, I mean, I don't go into those things because. I'm not much interested in I think here one point more to be clear. <laughs> what is the nature of mind? Because as we understand mind, that is not the case in the case of Buddhism. Because in Buddhism, mind is nothing but chitta, that is cognition. Okay. Yes. So that point should be made clear, I think. Because when the question is asked, he is thinking of mind as we understand you know, something like uh, uh, which is there in our uh, head or somewhere else. And that is not the case in Buddhism. Yes. So uh, I have a question that follows up on that. The Buddhists also believe in the theory of karma, hmm. that there is some kind of justice hmm. uh, in this life or in the next. What then is the nature of karma? Because again, the Jains believe in a very mechanical form of karma, that it is like a balance that must, or like an account statement of accounts, where credits and debits must be balanced at all times. Whereas for the Buddhists, that is, that balance is, I'm told, approximate. But the question is, what is the nature of uh, karma that goes from one life to the next? How is that even possible? What is the, because they say that it travels, what is what <laughs> Uh, in the case of Gaidism, it is Jiva and uh, Jiva is a person uh, of the same size as body which carries karma particles. And those uh, it uh, goes to the next life uh, along with those karma particles. So in Buddhism, of course, karma doesn't assume the form of any particle or substance. But uh, basically, uh, 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 karma is mental, it is called Chaitanya. Uh, so basic karma is chetana, and the kind of chetana through which you perform either the vocal action or physical action. Uh, but more, what is more important is what kind of chetana you have when you perform that action. Mm -hmm. Now that chetana has some scar, has a kind of impression on that mind. That is, every, again, mind within a mind says, so next mind, next mind, next mind. So next mind carries the uh, samskara of the previous month. And this process goes on and this is also regarded as beginning uh, And then uh, naturally when it is reborn, it is reborn along with those impressions of the past actions. I think I should hear a few points if I am not wrong. If I am wrong, please correct me. Uh, in Buddhism, uh, as you think accordingly, you become. As you think accordingly, you become. So in the, in the next life, as you get thinking, accordingly you get reborn and accordingly you suffer. Therefore, the process one should follow to, um, to think in, in the thinking process, one should remove it. And it is not according to Jaina philosophy, because whatever you are thinking, that is not important because you have credit and debit as you observed. This type of is not possible here. Because if someone is born, when Mithya Gyan is removed, in Mithya is removed in a Buddhist philosophy, then there is nirvana. Because thinking process is changed, completely changed. Therefore, there is no further rebirth. As I understand. Yes. Uh, that is mainly because in Jainism, uh, not only mental action, but also physical actions. And important, they, uh, they have an impact on people. Yeah. So, you have to uh, practice uh, penance uh, where then there is a process of samvara, nirjara. Yeah. So, uh, by samvara, you have to disallow uh, karmic particles uh, entering into jiva. So, nirjara, you have to uh, forget the prayer particles which have already entered into jiva and ultimately purification of jiva. Yeah. Here also, purification of mind, purity of mind. Both the systems ultimately talk about purity of mind, purity of jiva, 
as a means to liberate the Buddhism, which is a very rigorous and difficult process. Uh, in Buddhism, comparatively, uh, it is since it focuses on, on your mind uh, and not on uh, other aspects, there is bodily actions and uh, I mean, they are supposed to be consequences of mental actions. They are not to be take separately taken care of. If you focus on mental action, then you automatically have effect on your bodily and mental actions. Yes, sir. Sir, you. since you are a Buddhist scholar, I'm tempted to ask you one more question. <laughs> it may not be related to this, but you may just think, if you know the answer, you can give me. What is the cause of population, you know, explosion and rise? From where you know too many new beings they arise and the population goes up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, there are so, so many new This world is not the only world. There are other worlds. And from here, uh, I mean, when living beings die, die, they can be reborn in other worlds and so on and so forth. But, I mean, they, uh, they is not an explanation of how <laughs> <laughs> I may add one step regarding this Jaina and Buddhist concept of mind. It, it's rightly said that in Buddhism, mind is more important, while in Jainism, physical or material action, because there are karma leshyas. In Buddhism, there are samskaras or impressions. In Jainism, there are leshyas. They stick to the body, the impressions of the karmas that we do. So there, the notion is more physical, and here the whole focus is on the mental. But in Buddhism, mental is physical. So, <laughs> so that's but in Buddhism, there is one problem that in Jainism there is one theory. In Vaishveshika, there are continuously for centuries. But in Buddhism, there are within Buddhism there are so many theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes a very complex. Yeah. 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 So a big hand for Professor Gok. Go. We are five minutes ahead of time, so we can take a. So it's a pleasure to introduce another dear friend, Professor Shyam Sundar, who's the James L. Frank Professor of Accounting Emeritus at Yale School of Management and also a Professor of Economics and uh, a fellow of the Whitney Humanities Center at Yale. He's a world-renowned accounting theorist and experimental e economist. In fact, I've taught many of his papers on behavioral economics, including one that is my favorite, indicating that intelligence can arise. It's a very Buddhist position amongst completely mindless uh, behavior. <laughs> but the paper is called Zero Intelligence Traders. As long as there is an institution called the market, rational behavior can arise. He's been a past president of the American Accounting Association, a former director of the Milstein Center for Corporate Governance and Performance at Yale, a distinguished fellow at the Center for the Study of Science and Technology Policy in Bangalore, and many other uh, such appointments worldwide and many other honors. But the thing that I want to mention about him is his extraordinary generosity. Uh, I've known him for the better part of a decade, perhaps a little bit more. I first got to know him when I was at Ahmedabad University. And I was struck by his willingness to help with any worthy cause, his willingness to step up and uh, contribute to wherever we were facing difficulties and unstintingly give his time and more importantly his advice uh, to help us reach ever greater heights. He's of course scaled them, but the thing about him is that he's helping others move in that direction. So that makes him unique. That spirit of generosity is what characterizes Shyam. And so when I requested him, you know, to join us, he agreed, immediately agreed. He said he was heading in a different direction at that time, but he said, no, that's fine, we make it work. And here he is. And uh, that same spirit of generosity carries uh, through 
in uh, Manjula, his, his wife, his wonderful wife. So, uh, and they, their home in New Haven is a magnet, a refuge, a meeting point for all kinds of uh, wonderful activities, scholars, visitors, friends, friends to be. So that's the kind of person he is. And uh, he's deeply interested in issues of Indian philosophy. He's written several papers on the Indian tradition, including uh, on accounting thought, the incipient nature of accounting thought in Kautilya's Arthashastra. So not only, is a very, not only is he a very fine scholar of management, he's also a very fine scholar of Indic systems, Indian knowledge systems. So his perspective would be uniquely useful as having both an insider and an outsider. That's in some senses uh, a very valuable, in many senses, it's a very valuable perspective to have. So with that, Shyam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sharon, for that uh, such generous comments. Uh, but I'm especially grateful to you and uh, Professor Shashi Prabha Kumar and, uh, uh, to uh, uh, not only to invite me, give me this chance, uh, because uh, until you called me, I knew very little about the uh, Philosophy. And uh, uh, though I started reading after <laughs> <laughs> you are sweet. Uh, and it has been a wonderful journey. I can't say I know very much about it yet. This is clear from my comments and questions, and I hope they didn't, uh, you didn't mind too much. But I've learned a lot for what it's worth. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to use this time this precious time of yours to talk a little bit about more broader, not broader, but my own issues that I have been working with. And use these weeks to try to think of how it relates to Nyaya philosophical system on which I have made not much progress except these two days have been wonderful. Uh, so please forgive me for being very uh, incomplete and incomprehensible round five. Uh, so, uh, as an overview, I'm going to talk about uh, four or five topics, all in the context of what we do in business schools today, of what I have been doing and many of my students do. And uh, first is the decision-making paradigm. Uh, other paradigms are on the horizon, considered but not really taken very seriously. Same thing is true of causality. By it's clear that Nayaka uh, uh, and others thought very carefully about causality. Its treatment in uh, today's uh, research, social science research especially, is, uh, I think is highly unsatisfactory. I'll talk a little bit about risk and uncertainty, which is an important part, and you will tell me how risk and uncertainty has been incorporated in NIA system. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds sharp. Maybe NIA, also the Quranic, other schools. But risk and uncertainty still seem to be explicitly dealt with. In, uh, perhaps it is, but you'll tell me about it. But I'll talk, talk a little bit about that. Direct observation of institutions uh, as a way of dealing with complexity that 
um, Shalene just talked about. And finally, a three tier model that uh, I've been working on most recently of trying to understand human behavior, in which instead of starting with higher human faculties, our proposal is that we start with the laws of principles that apply to the inanimate world before moving to the principles of the biological world, and only finally mm -hmm. moving to the third level, which is the higher faculties, uh, human faculties. While the current practice seems to be exactly the opposite. We start with the higher faculties, and for most part, stop right there. <laughs> Never move you that. Uh, we explain human and social phenomena in terms of uh, special dominance that human beings have. Not common to inanimate world and certainly not. And not, mostly not common to the bio biological world. We are proposing something opposite and I'll try to argue why that is the case. And I hope that, that I know there is a half an hour uh, time for discussion. Be wonderful to get your reactions. All right. So uh, with that, first perspectives on individual being. The uh, in social sciences today, it seems that the decision making is the dominant paradigm which to seek an understanding of how humans behave. There are two variations on that. One is optimization, that human beings try to, uh, uh, should I lower this? Is that right? The human beings try to see of all the, uh, what is their opportunity set, of all the possible options they have available, which option will help them uh, best reach their goal of their religion and or aspirations. That's one approach, optimization approach, which is the dominant approach in management sciences. And the other is the heuristic, which is rule of that people live their lives not trying to figure out what is the best thing to do, but simply they have through their life's experience, most of us develop very rough and ready rules of thumb and act on the basis of those. And they more or less work out. Perhaps maybe right, though not always exactly right. Uh, I should mention there are, of course, alternatives to this decision making perspective, understanding human behavior. Uh, I'll just list them very briefly. Biological endowments, example, language acquisition. Uh, it has been very only limited progress in figuring out how children acquire language. Some people claim that uh, if children had to learn, they had to be taught language, they will never, never learn. <laughs> they just acquired it and uh, they are throwing about it, but still, it's a highly uh, mysterious idea. And uh, second, uh, habit. Uh, a lot of our behavior is, it seems to be explained by habit. That's not either optimization or linguistics perspective. Socialization and imitation. Example, fashion. Come to my campus, 99% <laughs> of the students are wearing blue jeans. Why? <laughs> That's the reality of the last four or five decades of phenomenon. Changes over time. Uh, emotions. I'm very little room actually. In formal social science, there's some 
love, anger, hate, uh, are their role in that behavior. Uh, morality and ethics uh, they are considered almost a side issue. Seriously, uh, agitation it should be. And uh, individuality and self expression and creativity in human behavior. Uh, it's been very difficult to uh, meet the challenge of figuring out free will. I'll come back to that. We can't decide whether we have free will. Because it's one of those and if you do it, if you don't, uh, issue. All right. Uh, so, what would be the consequence of exploring other paradigms of human behavior outside the social and heuristics? Even heuristics are just trying to push their way in because the decision making paradigm. Optimization paradigm has dominated the scene for the last five decades at least. The second thing I want to mention is uh, uh, the causal thinking. The attempt to organize data uh, often centered around causal models. Also, what comes naturally to us. And uh, in natural sciences, physics, chemistry, etc., it seems to have worked incredibly well. That's what the movie told us. Computers, projections, electricity, power, drone, watches. Uh, it's often attributed to the ability of uh, physical sciences, mathematics, and you know, physical science, especially, to uh, use the causal models. But outside physical models, the attempts to extend causal models has met a lot of difficulties. There are a lot of problems of inference and yeah, <laughs> scholars uh, figured that out a long time ago. The challenges of modeling and reasoning uh, when you go outside, which not that there are no such problems in natural sciences, but in social sciences, they are uh, uh, This is not new, these definitions of causality and these basic approaches to causality, they probably exist in the IR, are taught from Aristotle in my university, and um, have been uh, they are all, all wrong. Uh, and yet, it's, well, it seems to work well in natural sciences. In social sciences, it's extremely difficult to get a uh, positive inference. Uh, selection of samples is very problematic. Uh, which data I can use. There's always possibility of spurious correlation among the data. Quite often, as was pointed out yesterday, correlation is often interpreted as causation. Well, very often, it's still done. A number of papers in which I see that being done mm -hmm. is still not trivial. Uh, possibility of reverse causality. If I think you're going to Take me and the village just because of time. But you haven't hit me yet. So is it your hitting me the cause of my hitting you? <laughs> because possibility of your hitting me was to come later, didn't come forward. So in the matrix, people call it green, green your cause causality. It's very Ignomatrix and experiments try to address these challenges in social sciences, but that's not easy because, as I mentioned, experiment itself requires uh, dealing with the causality. And most of the time, when you design the experiment, there's a cause for that. 
and that pause almost makes it very difficult to um, to meet that uh, conditions cause of the um, uh, okay, I'm 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 just going to just skip this uh, for sake of time. Uh, But, so there are conflict between two perspectives. In the decision-making model, we cannot do research and come up with new ideas or even conduct an experiment. Uh, because choice of experimental design and treatment would have, would it be a consequence of predetermined preferences and external conditions. And uh, so there's no individual responsibility for what we do. And in the sentient being model, when we regard ourselves as in control of ourselves, all actions can be computed by individual will with perfect explanatory power. Then there's no use conducting an experiment or an answer data because free will explains everything. Why is, is he climbing the tree? was a monster. It's a perfect explanation for anybody who is any that doesn't help. Uh, third, let me talk about understanding choice under risk. Uh, please correct me that the, but there was perhaps I think I heard the word sunshine uh, mentioned a couple of times in the last two days, last three days. But is there any uh, significant treatment of uncertainty and risk in Nyaya uh, and other philosophies? Yeah, there's, there's a word that is used in the Gita for uncertain that is Yadritche. Literally means his his will. Okay. No one's. Yeah, is that correct? Yadrichik is the word, and that's also used for stochastic. Technically, yes. Random, random behavior. Without any cause of something. Exactly, random behavior. Unexplained. Unexplained. Yadrichik. Uncertain is something unexplained. What is not decided? So what is the difference between anishchit and yadrichit? Maybe it's risk and uncertainty. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. So, you are asking the difference between Anishchik and Yadrichik. Yadrichik is uh, in the sense that when we are doing something, action is involved. Anishchitata is there, but it is, uh, it is to say action is not involved in that case. It is, it is not necessary. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a state of uncertainty, but action is not involved in that. So would it be that one is external uh, uncertainty and the other one is uncertainty about what you're doing? What you what you're likely to do? Likely to do that. Awesome. So uncertainty in behavior or uncertainty in terms of behavior? Yeah. So let, let me just mention just a few minutes the way it has been handled in these last hundred years, maybe a little more since Pandora was. 270, 60 years. But it was not 1738, I guess. Uh, first, uh, Bernoulli uh, was a uh, Swiss gentleman who was the first one to come up with an answer to what is called St. Petersburg Paradox. And St. Petersburg Paradox is a, a very simple game. Uh, will on toss of coin will back one of these answers. If uh, you win, the game is over. 
If you don't play, we will play the game. Please. If you win there, game is over. If you don't, you play the game. And will you keep playing until the game is over? And this is the game. How much are you willing to pay for the privilege of playing this game? The first round expected value of that is a rupee. Second round expected value is also half a rupee. Third round expected value is half a rupee. So now until infinity expected value of each round is half a rupee. So because the problem you are doubling the bet, but the probability that you will play that stage is a problem. So from here to infinity, uh, you add up half a rupee each in many times, you should be willing to play it for me. For the privilege of playing that game with you. How many people are willing to pay more than three rupees that debt? Most people say, okay, two, two rupees, five And that was St. Peter's book. Why was your wife? Is that the case? And Bernoulli, Andrew Bernoulli came up with an answer. That the reason is that we don't value money linear. If you double the amount of money, the value you attach to it is, is less than a mm -hmm. uh, law of function. It was a law of function. But anyway, so it goes like that. So the expected value of all those infinite possibilities of many infinite, uh, infinite rounds even is not infinite. It's very small, finite. That was his explanation. The other thing I'll mention about 100 years ago, actually, 1921, there are two PhD dissertations published in the US, uh, actually, one in England, one in the uh, US. Uh, in England, it was John Maynard Keynes, the uh, economist, same Keynes who wrote. Uh, the famous book on money later, his tea ties on probability. That was his PhD dissertation at Cambridge. And uh, he came up with theories of how people deal with uncertainty in problems. And then there was another big book by Frank A. that was also his dissertation. And he, um, he, he was actually trying to explain how entrepreneurs made money. And for that, he distinguished risk from uncertainty. And he said, the risk is those situations like a rolling wheel or a game of dice or a toss of coin, where you know every possible outcome which can happen, mm -hmm. and you know it's possible. That's the story. And then he said, uncertainty are the situations in which you either don't know all the possible outcomes, or like today, <laughs> or traffic, like, uh, oh, and flights we know, but rain and other things, stock market, price of potatoes uh, in the market tomorrow. That either we don't know all the possible outcomes or we don't know the probabilities associated with them or both. We don't, we don't know that. And he said, said uncertainty. He said, most of the time we live in a world of uncertainty and not risk. Unfortunately, for the last hundred years, both those books, uh, 
seminal as they were, but almost completely, you know. But, and almost everything has been converted into risk. In this. So we managed to persuade ourselves and our students and almost force our students to associate probability, probabilities or think that they know all possible outcomes of the process and then calculate, apply it, following that calculation. So, in fact, uh, when people have tried to do experiments to measure if Bernoulli's theory about people associating the value of money going like that have not been supported at all. I'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, there are some pictures of actual data. I'm sorry, no. Can you see that? Yes, yes. The, uh, the straight line was 45 degree line, and these are individuals oil well uh, drillers from Texas. That's some, they went out uh, most of us in North Virginia in 1951. And those things look nothing like what we said they were supposed to do. They didn't turn out to be like that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so now empirically from the data, people have developed, there's a list of all the procedures a large number of procedures that psychologists and economists have been devised over the last about 90 or so years to try to figure out what is the attitude of human beings to this and allowing for the possibility that different individuals will react to risk in the future. Uh, and uh, these are, it's just a list, I won't go through all these methods at the time. But uh, we did a book <laughs> some 10 years ago, uh, looking at all the data in common, and we know almost nothing about the previous system. Because people are, don't behave in such a regular fashion, fit into any of these. These uh, these uh, predetermined determined uh, formats. Then we looked at uh, the uh, various aspects of the economy: health, medicine, sports, gambling, engineering, insurance, real estate, bond market, stock market, and interest rates markets. Uh, and aggregate model to labor markets, inflation markets, and so on, uh, things like that, to see how far can we explain the actual behavior data from these parts of the economy by the risk models that we've been using. And <laughs> again, uh, the answer turns out to be uh, almost very little is explained. An aggregate level. You know, uh, the, that was the individual level, this is the aggregate level, the natural thing. Uh, so, uh, aggregate level evidence from the field is very, very iffy. Uh, so, the loss of the predictive content in social sciences, uh, they have these simple economic theories. But they have not, in spite of very deep faith in that theory in economics, in my field, uh, that has not proved to be very, those theoretical models have not been very good at predicting for either individual people or markets as a whole. Okay. Uh, now, I'll, there are some exceptions, and I'll show you some exceptions. Uh, there's an economist, his name is Werner Smith in the US. Uh, he did an experiment in his classroom. Uh, uh, I know you're not into economics, but on the left hand side is the demand and supply functions in a market that he created in his classroom. And on the right hand side, the dotted line 
is the predicted price at which these market, he should expect the prices to be in the small and the uh, crooked line is the actual price that they fix. Now it depends uh, whether you think that the crooked line is or is not close enough to the theoretical model that, that economists use from the left side of this. Uh, let me uh, show you uh, uh, Shailen that pointed out a few, uh, few minutes ago in introducing me. After the stock market crash in 87, uh, everybody was blaming computer programs uh, being used by Wall Street firms for the crash in the stock market. I said, why is the market crash? I said, computer programs themselves are not causing crash. So I asked the, my dean for permission to teach a course on program training. So I developed software and created a lab in which students in 22 computers were trained with each other. Uh, this is and uh, and then they could also write programs to just replace themselves as traders. So AI <laughs> that either you could trade or your your horse could. <laughs> what happens? Uh, let me let me just uh, not spend time on this to show you this. At the bottom bottom right panel. It's a uh, price is observed in the market with human traders. As you can see, the uh, the firm line is the uh, theoretical price which was expected in that market, and slightly fit line is the actual price. Bottom right. When I replace those students by what we call zero intelligence traders, basically random programs, random number generators with only, only, uh, only constraint was don't throw your money in. Don't buy above what it is worth to you. Don't sell below it. You get the middle chart, the chart in the right middle. And of course, when you don't have any constraint on them on the right top, you get that chart. So the difference between the right top and right bottom is just one simple constraint on throwing money away. That's it. And it was almost 100% efficient. They almost made as much money as they could have made and uh, the efficiency of the right middle and right bottom market is about the same. So, as you know, Adam Smith, a long time ago, more than almost two and a half centuries ago, said it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the regard for their own interest. That was his famous statement that when people pursue their selfish goals, the market institutions allow them and to engage in activities that means that actually we found that we don't even need their selfish goals. There's much weaker conditions are actually sufficient. Uh, how much time do we have? Yeah, after 20 minutes, easy. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, since we talked a lot about AI yesterday, I'm going to show you a little bit more in somewhat more complex environments 
what happens when we introduce artificially intelligent agents with a very minimal level of intelligence. This is the data generated in an experiment that Charlie Plot and I did in 1982. These are price paths generated. Uh, the dotted lines are the uh, horizontal dotted lines are the theoretical model predictions and the blue lines are the actual data by complement traders, uh, which you can see in most cases that data converges near the firm line and not the dotted line or something. Now let me show you what happened with when we replaced human beings by very minimally intelligent artificial agents. Not quite as good, the cloud, the red line, uh, red is the median line for, for these artificial agents. They show similar tendencies, but they are not exactly the same. Human beings do it much better. It just not that far out of line with what you showed us yesterday. Uh, uh, there's another one. This is human data. This is, uh, you can see human data with artificial data with minimal intelligence. Third one, human data, artificial data. Fourth, human, artificial data. Okay, so um, uh, the so even without optimization, you remember the decision theory discussion that I was saying. We said uh, everybody is optimized, but these the guys, my artificial agents, are not optimized. They are they are using very little intelligence, to act almost randomly, and but the efficiency is markets is almost hundred percent. It suggests that there are properties that are associated efficiency, especially it's a property of an aggregate. It appears in the market, even though it's absent in the individual. So, uh, you know, uh, as you know, it's the call in, uh, in mathematics and game theory now, we call it uh, emergence, but I'm sure the idea has been around for a very long time. And here's an older literature. I think Shirley Keithy has this uh, metaphor of chariot in the performance of chariot. Yeah, it shows all seven, uh, uh, all, all seven propositions the chariot is the components, or components are the chariot, so it's shape and all that. All of them are false. Uh, that, uh, the chariot, well, there you can see it obviously, but here you can't see it obviously, and yet, uh, in the properties of the aggregate seem much. You can take a glass of water, you can say, this glass of water has billions of molecules of water executing that uh, Brownian movement, random walk in three dimensions. And the movement of any particular molecule in there is completely unpredictable. And yet, if I turn this glass of water, you can predict exactly what's going to happen. And uh, because there you are predicting the, any, uh, the, the gross behavior of the body of water is quite predictable, a glass or a river or a thing, and yet the individual parts very different properties. So that's nothing new, I guess, but uh, when we find that in economic systems, also the systems. Uh, I should skip something here. I need to talk about something else. Uh, 
So uh, focusing on properties as social institutions can be uh, quite important. Uh, my impression from uh, this uh, brief exposure to NIA has been that the focus there is largely on individual behavior and aggregate social level behavior or outcomes are not the subject of major intervention in Nairobi. That's not true. Perhaps you and uh, or I can say here at this stage is that the behavior of components in their whole can be uh, quite different, but that's been wrong for a long time. My final point is uh, about this three tier system, and I'm going to use three examples for that. In the first example, consider a beach. So on the beach, there is beach sand above the line on the left side and water below the line on the left side. And on that uh, uh, porch, sitting a lifeguard and the child screaming for help, drowning. So the lifeguard gets off his watchtower and runs to the child runs through a sand on the beach and then swims in the water to reach the child. What path does the lifeguard follow? Does the lifeguard follow the straight line path from A to B? That's a shortest path. Well, it turns out the lifeguard doesn't if you take a look at the right side, instead of following that dotted line from A to B, lifeguard takes a little more, more softer angle. He follows the red line. He runs a little longer on the sand, the light color, and a little shorter distance, he swims to the Dark blue. Why? Because he can run faster. Then he can swim. So, so that red path actually minimizes the amount of time it takes. Even though the straight line will be the shortest path, the fastest path with the red line. So people did some experiments also that. How does, how do they behave? They behave like that. A bunch of people who are being uh, trained, uh, who are not being trained, who are tested. There are about 20, 50 or 20 people. First round, they take many different times. Second time, you see, <laughs> the amount of time they took came down and it is very, very terrible. And on a third chance, they of course they are much faster. Mm -hmm. Question: Why? Why do? So, of course, the job is lifeguard. He's trying to save the child. Right? It, 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 it's important. It's teleology. is what we use to explain uh, the behavior of the lifeguard. Uh, he has to, his job is to save the child's life. That he can do by getting there by the fastest route. And either through training or education or experience or thinking about it, he does this, right? Fair enough? Okay. Let's go to the second example. I'm going to replace a lifeguard and an ant. An ant will actually, which has thousands of. And the beach is replaced by a smooth surface of like the stick. And the water is replaced by a rough surface like that. And on the felt, instead of a fish, uh, I mean, instead of the child, uh, we have some sugar syrup. And if you let the, let the 
hands go back and forth. And it should be time what happens. Okay. They, they, they establish a boundary. Initially, they spread in all direction, but they established a boundary. What boundary will they establish? Is it a straight line in the yeah, you don't believe it, it is an experiment. The right bottom is a sugar that you, uh, with just above the green line on the left side is there where the source is because, because you know, they go almost. At a very steep, uh, very almost flat angle, and then turn into a that's the path they established. Yeah, it takes them a few days. They do. This is also the path of light. This is the Let me come to that. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Okay. <laughs> that's the path of light. So the question is we use. Books, Ryojan as the lifeguard and the training and the mental faculties to explain. Okay. How do you explain this? Well, it turns out biologists have a theory. Uh, there's uh, the plants leave their more little chemical molecules on the trails, whichever is the fastest trail, whichever ends them. Test. Well, those trails will get the most dense, density, greatest density of pheromones, and they are more likely to be followed gradually. Okay. I mean, you can almost buy home, you know, this is exterior. No high faculties, no work, <laughs> you know. Uh, now the higher faculties are human beings. I mean, you can use evolutionary or biological or pheromone chemical explanations. All right, third example. Now we're going to replace the, uh, the lifeguard sun and the drowning child with a fish. So, uh, ray of light on both ones, the sun. Traveled mostly through back home. Through water. Travel under the water. Look at the fish. Fire the fish. What path does the light fall? Does it follow the straight line path, which is the shortest path? <laughs> Turns out it follows the same path that the chief did. Angle of those, angle of incidence up there on the top, angle of the traction on the bottom, the ratio of the sign, the ratio of the velocity with which light travels in the vacuum. Now the question. We use one explanation to explain the behavior of this light car. We use the second explanation to explain the behavior of this. How does it look like that? If the protons were fraction of the second date, what did they Will something be there? Why are they What's going on here? Are these three examples, are they capturing the same fundamental pattern? Or are these just superficial similarities among three very different? So our argument we made in our paper. Okay, by the way, this is this has been known for a long time. 
that since Euclid, Ptolemy, Aaron, Ibn, Saul, Al Hassan, Snell, Descartes, Omar, Hamilton, I mean, uh, for almost 2000 years, people have lost people who have spoken this. this thing. Okay. So the question is is it just superficial similarity or fundamental similarity? Because uh, it is still uh, dolphins and sharks. There are very much evolution in birds and the acts of bosses and so on. There are two animals, which we turns out these huge elephant, Triton elephant, this tiny little hyrax, which is like the mouse, are very closely in the mix between biology. So they look very different. At least, what's going on in this case? It's not clear at all. So, argument we make, and I actually stop soon because we that it's not We can apply in 1724, a French mathematician, his name was. I don't know if that's the right French pronunciation. I can never pronounce anything in French, right? Uh, he proposed a uh, principle. Uh, uh, it's called either a uh, I mean, stationary action principle. Stationary action principle. This is telling me that we use to derive almost entire physics. Yeah. If you throw this thing up in the air, uh, up in the vacuum, actually, or air for that matter, its trajectory can be determined by uh, one simple principle, stationary action. But action is basically uh, the integral, sorry, from the term, integral of the difference between the uh, potential and kinetic energy of air. Any point in the trajectory of a thing, if you take that integral and see whether the integral is either minimum or maximum, that would be prediction. And a lot of laws of physics are derived. Why does the optimization principle in physics is used to explain it? There is no, I explained a moment ago, I argue that. Social systems can optimize. We look at this whole social system about this. So it's optimized. Purely inanimate word also has an optimization process. Wait, this is no cognition. A neural system. Uh, the, uh, the, so, we are so proud of our higher faculties that we try to explain everything in terms of our higher And our argument is, wait a minute, we can do exactly the reverse. We could first say, let's give a chance to the laws and principles that govern the inanimate world. Because the, Laws and principles that apply to inanimate world are uh, also applied to us. After all, we are also energy in nature. We are free of those laws. Let's apply them. To explain part of what happens to us, what remains to be explained, is applied biological principles that arise from the beginning. And what it means, then let us go to intelligence and memory and buddhi and uh, <laughs> learning and other uh, all the references, other such factors which are peculiar to us. That's what it means. We can get a better sense of human beings more than we do by starting and stopping at higher level. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so much food for thought. So the floor is open for questions. I have a few, but 
Ja, und ich sage für den Schluss. Yes, my, I don't have a mind for a bit of hand in everyone here, but I uh, yeah, actually for recording purposes, we're not famous. It's actually, I was, as I was listening to this, it was fascinating. I was thinking of your interest in institutions of higher learning and yes. whether I know you've been very interested in sort of tweaking or, you know, arranging principles yes. of, of these institutions so that you have desired outcomes. So. I was wondering whether some of these principles inform your own thinking about the importance of structuring institutions in a certain way for them to thrive rather than you know, better. Yeah, I absolutely. But uh, yes, a little bit. I, I will come to that. But first, Sean, you have the floor. Whether that, I know you've been thinking about institutions also. So, uh, yes, I, I think uh, this. We have for institutional that like this use of the word design has been considered too pejorous in most cases. And we most people I think going back to Spencer and perhaps others, uh, people think social institutions evolve over time. I think so Spencer this extended Darwinian theory. Uh, of uh, this species evolution and so on, students, and largely people have stayed with it. But in more recent, uh, starting with the work of uh, Leonid Hurwitz, for example, uh, where mechanism design can be and other attempts are being made now that we can actually design institutions uh, to be more efficient. Having said that, I should also warn you because in a few instances where I have seen people designing institutions in a way, there be huge mistakes. <laughs> because all those people they thought were dumb, it's mm -hmm. amazing how smart dumb people are. Mm -hmm. no. uh, I, I, I remember early 90s, I was at a conference, a summer camp in two weeks in Stanford. to get concessions on those things. Well, it turned out uh, a number of women in minority groups actually won those uh, options uh, at concessional rates, and then the promptly sold them off to the uh, AT&T and big guys, which nobody had actually uh, anticipated earlier than not. So uh, it hard. In social systems, there are always so many variables that uh, social scientists uh, will be, will have to be quite humble in presuming they can design, but yes, they can. Really Other questions? Yes. In Vedantic theory, there is no of So consciousness is everywhere, somewhere in more expression, somewhere in least expression, somewhere through sense organ, no expression. And uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose, when experimented, 10th May 1901, right? So he experimented on three years at a time, myself, matter, and plant. <laughs> and uh, he found that there are so many properties 
with all that shit. For an example of fatigueness, we also feel, plant also feel, and even metal also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, if, yeah. if you yeah. matter for more than the hour, that uh, actually presents a certain pain, then it will press. And after taking some rest, matter also feels fresh. It covers, okay. It covers. Yeah. And uh, that can work again. So after experimenting and then exhibiting it before scientists, the group of scientists, we finally concluded that there is no demarcation line between animate and inanimate. So it is just the limitations of our senses, our mind, that we have divided these two groups, animate and inanimate. <laughs> so after concluding this, he didn't stop. He quoted Upanishad. Oh. That what have I experimented before you that has been proclaimed three thousand years back. Sarvam Navigam Brahma. And everywhere there is a consciousness. Now, after quantum physics, even the word door slipped. Very famous And uh, so many scientists accept that even electron is conscious. So it changes its roots. And thus, some of them name electron as omnijective reality. Omnijective reality means combination of consciousness and mind. Uh, so, what's the term? Omni? Omnijective. Omnijective. And so, if we look at this kind of understanding, there are, then it can happen. What you have explained to them. So, there is a cosmic law, cosmic principle, and the norms and the rules and regulations in nature. So, that can take decision that can create such type of a structure. So, with our little knowledge, only certain person claim that we can do that. <laughs> we can do this. Human hubris. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is nothing but the expression of ignorance. That Vedanta claims. Thank you. Yes, one we, point. When we say that if you drop this pen, where is it going to stop? Say the stop where this uh, potential energy is being passed, right? Uh, and say, well, is it as a measuring, a uh, way of measuring this potential energy? Is it monitoring? Does it have a sense of potential energy? Why does it care whether it's being noticed or not? It's just a law of nature. Yes, law of nature, but when you drop it, then what measurement is recorded, that is not absolute. So it is always approximate. It also shows our lacking of understanding or the lacking of the measurement or method of measurement. I will give you another example. So when two trains are running opposite in the opposite direction, then the speed will be added. But when Two opposite rays crossing each other, then mm -hmm. that speed can't be added. Yeah. The speed will remain the same. So the speed of light is around 3 lakh per second. So it will not be 6 lakh kilometer per second. That speed will remain the same. So again, it is the design of the nature and nature is nothing but the power of consciousness so one point what about stock market it also behaves and you it's have not a lot of it's the play of maya <laughs> so you know,
when there is a difference between I and Vedanta, you will want to Well, at a certain point, Vedanta yes. said it can't be explained. So, when Naya said it means you are unable to satisfy us, it is lost. Vedanta said this is not our, our, yes. we say, lacking of knowledge. It is our alankar. Mm -hmm. So if someone can define Maya, then it is not Maya. <laughs> Maya means always uncertainty. That I told. This is our alankar. This is not our insufficiency. That I told that you are always bringing mysticism. <laughs> it's it's a, there are two layers of understanding. Looks like uh, Chawak is back. Another <laughs> <laughs> the point of social mind. Another is beyond the social mind. You are beyond the human. That we can't catch. So there, cosmic consciousness plays their role. It's role. So Vedan says that there are two layers of understanding. One is within our ignorance, within our, you can say, limited knowledge, and then the absolute knowledge. So if you are understanding these two layers of knowledge and reality, then you can explain all these things. What you are calling it as cosmic consciousness. What is cosmic consciousness? Cosmic consciousness is the Brahman. So Brahman is created. Brahman doesn't do anything. Brahman does everything to Ishwar. Brahman does everything through Maya. You can say Ishwar. everything through Maya. Ishwar is also not doing it. Brahman conditions itself through its own energy that is known as Ishwar. So Ishwar means Sarvan Sarvasaktiman. And Ishwar. Can do everything. Everything is done by Maya. Maya on the ground of this world. So I think uh, let's address the questions to progress. We, we save this for So I'm better addressing to each other. Yeah. I won't be <laughs> because I'm the other question. Sorry, sorry. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, but oh, it's not Adi, but please formulate your question. No. Hi. <laughs> so you have given one example, like uh, the water in the glass. So we don't know the behavior of one particular, but we don't know the behavior of the uh, collective. In the same way, we don't know the behavior of one individual, which stock market us. But sometimes we are able to know the behavior of many people. Is it so? Yeah. You see, emergence is something more than the average. Emergence is actually quite different from the average. Because uh, you can you can take the average yeah. of all the billion molecules in the sparse. That's not how you think it's actually. As average, we'll probably put uh, not enough of it. This is to, <laughs> to know what the average will be. Certainly in markets, market outcomes that I showed you during the last kind of time. Market behavior is not the same under random individuals as if all of them were in the average. The, the, the idea of emergence is a component of properties of the earth. Aggregate has properties that are not derivable from the people and by So you cannot establish causality 
Please, that's how I, I understand it, which is maybe somebody else will be it. And for individuals, uh, property is what accepted by me and of the aggregate property that be accepted by this one. Okay. You experts will agree on that. I'll, I'll jot it down and learn more about it. Okay. May I ask for focus on individual and around this and as you know some people have argued i think we talked about it they just focus on indians and even mayaika i mean very countries you substantiate aggregate into avayavil so every time this avayavil may not be a uniform goal so the behavior of elements of Avayava and the behavior of Avayavi as a whole, and there may not be any fixed relation. Parts of the Avayavi means they are individual, not aggregate. Aggregate turned into an individual because they are not Avayava. Avayava is individual. Aggregate is causing the Avayavi. Aggregate is yes. causing Avayavi. Avayavi is their individual, mm -hmm. not not a. But this is Vedantin's position because Vedantin believes that there is a unifying principle that unifies everyone altogether. That the property of that unifying reality is the property of the unity. Okay. Well, I think the proper word would be Sanghato. Yes, whether we believe in Sanghato, if you say there are many things that they call Sanghato, it is an anarchy. It is the only thing on empirical level. Well, I have it. Did you? Can I make well there? Okay. Mai Sarva Midam Krotam Sutra Mani Karayo. This is the statement of Bhagavad Gita. So, Manigara, you know, there are so many parts, yes. but there is a unifying thread. And the property of that, that aggregate will be the property of four. You know? That will make an Avayami. Mahava. But that Mahava includes everyone. But in Avayami of Nyaya, then it is So, no, no, the question is this one. Uh, it's then Gokhari really to ask the question whether this mala garden is different from the you know, gems or not. Gems and then there are pearls, 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 pearls. I don't want this. There are many pearls, but there is a unifying principle. So that is the point. Whether the pearls and the garland are identical or different. No, identical in the sense of both. So, in the sense of both. But we are really like that each part is different from other. And there is no unifying principle. So, that is actually the difference between the aggregate of a whole and the, the property of the individual. So, does that take us back to Chantiti's uh, channel? Yeah, 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 the same example is there. It will be we can table here also. If you take the example of chariot and or if you take an example of a garden, yeah. both are equal. Yes. There is no difference at all. Yeah. So, I will say that chariot exists over and above the parts of a chariot. So this will say that no such there is no chariot at all. There are there no parts, are. you cannot make a whole out of that. Yeah. The but the Yankas will say there are two things one, the parts, and then the whole. And the whole lives in the part, whole is dependent upon the parts. You cannot take away, you cannot destroy the parts and take away, put outside the whole. And then what the is one, so this is what I have want to explain that the whole is the whole is the sum total of its parts. Is it Nayaika? No, no, but 
No, no, not some product. Gold. Gold is not some product. You will take a but then you can't collect from it. It is a new thing. But that is nothing but collection of parts. No, no, nothing. It is something different. Collection is the cause and the whole is the effect. Yes. Yes. But and you can whole, whole remains in parts. Yeah, whole appears yes. in events in appears. Yes. This is the position. Vedanta is in opposite opposite. Yeah. Vedanta says that the parts remain in the whole. So what is matter? Whole or part? Oh, what is what is the cause? Then what is the if cause? If you say not the issue. So no, no, what is the cause? Parts are whole. What is the cause? Me? Whole is cause. No, it is not possible because there were only when mix. There were no part. Then was made. What Nasti Sukh said, there, there was nothing. Only one was given. No, no, so when we all have a hundred cents. Yeah. If I may, if I may just cite yeah. one, one reference here uh, in terms of uh, in terms of physics. Uh, it's it may be it's not a wrong paper. The publishing line is the science in the 19th mm -hmm. century. Oh, it's a title. It's very interesting. Uh, the title is the title. is different. Is it? More or less is not either more or less. It's different. This is the narrative. No, just small, whatever. And uh, it's written by uh, Philip W. Anderson. Uh, he was a uh, 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 physicist. Uh, he also received a Nobel Prize for his. Uh, that doesn't mean anything in this conversation. But I just want to mention that this issue, and he argues very, uh, very well in this paper or in the reading, but. That, it, you know, in science, there's been a long term tendency towards what you call reductions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm showing philosophical schools, they are different. Reductionism that uh, you explain uh, this in terms of its components, their components in terms of their components, and their components can go. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, it So the, the reductionist tendency, in fact, uh, in the 1920s, uh, there was a big movement in the European scientists. It's called the Unity of Science Movement. The Unity of Science Movement. Following, you know, we were talking about uh, uh, Russell and Whitehead, this program to integrate uh, into a single structure all sciences and mathematics into one grand picture of the whole universe where everything will be explained in terms of its components. And uh, World War II came in the way, and uh, that movement. And then uh, a lot of these uh, people were uh, scientists were Jewish in uh, Europe and went to the US and then the team they reassembled and in fact they published used Chicago Press so two big volumes using science and mm -hmm. uh, I have copies of them on my <laughs> shelf but in the US and Carnap and all of that uh, and then by 1960, we were talking about hard. And by that time, of course, you know, the seven white head program and uh, Gordon was still taking care of that. So, I think Anderson's paper is such a very nice expedition. You don't have to agree with it. Science. It's not that you can reduce. Economics to psychology, psychology to biochemistry, biochemistry to chemistry, to physics to particle physics, and so on, or go up to uh, yeah. astronomy or astrophysics levels, and so on. Explain this. So, you know,
and they have some overlap with adjacent levels of aggregation. Some of this overflows across the boundaries of sciences. So the chemistry can be understood so physics or biology, but she has a sort of process. Economics will have its own principles, and for behavioral economics guys, think psychology can be explained, used to explain for economics. You know, this in this. Uh, that's it. Open oh, out my track now. So, <laughs> thank you for engaging this conversation. You had a number of questions. I did not wait on that. Yeah, yeah. Ruchi, you can go first. So, I, I don't know anything about the Jain philosophy, but this was reminding me of the Praman and the Nye that he had talked about, where he talked about part, and that there are, where he talked about a whole and parts. Professor Jain, in his uh, speech when he was talking, he said that one way of looking at things is that you look at the whole and you look at the parts. And that's the only way you can resolve what to understand what really the truth is. And I think when we were talking about the random individuals and collective behavior, it very closely reminded me of one whole and the parts of the whole themselves have individual properties. And he said that there's a long list of what these nays are and how do you identify each? So maybe there is some answer that you will find in the Jain philosophy if you're looking at the collective and parts, because he said that I'm resisting from the whole list, but very clearly because I think all I refer to my notes also, and he said that each of the nay has its own characteristics and can be defined by how to identify it and how does it relate to the whole. Okay. to say anything meaningful to respond to you, but thank you for your suggestion. Uh, this, it's ironically different, yeah. So my, so my view of Nyaya, the reason why I got so interested is because it has a very clear understanding of the map and the perception of that map, right? And I quoted Ramsey, uh, philosophy is all about steerable maps. So my interest in Nyaya stems from how do you reduce the error? At the end of the day, the reason why we are unhappy, the reason why we are not able to achieve our goals is because we don't perceive things as they are, but as we think they are, which may be totally different. In fact, it may be like night and day. You may think we have free will, but we don't. We are entirely a product of our circumstances, largely a product of our circumstances, and I do happen to believe that. So my question is the following. Here I'm motivated by the very striking example. I didn't know that uh, this had been studied in this fashion on the brackets to crow problem, right? Mm -hmm. That light does it, ants do it, and human swimmers do it. But if you think about it, the, so I'm going to think of it as plants because that is what Professor Jha talked about. So let's, I don't know how to quite deal with light, but so I'll deal, let me bring in three layers. Here. Plants, animals, and humans. And that is where the, I don't think this has been done before, but that is where the Nyaya category is very useful. The distinction between Vita, Vichar, etc. Plants only have sensation. They do not have any mental conception. They don't have a mind. Yet, plants find their way to the sun. Right? So that's a form of behavior that plants engage in. Right? They, they, they grow towards the sun. So that is one kind of behavior. The second is animal behavior. Now, animals also have, but animals do have a mind, but they don't have language. So they can solve problems, but they solve them in different ways. So their perception of the world is astatic because they don't have language so they can't improve it. But they can learn from behavior, but they can learn from experience, but they can't learn from perfection. Whereas humans have both sensation, the ability to learn from mistakes, as animals do, as ants do, 
but we also have the power of repression. So, so Sham, if we were to formulate a new theory of unified behavior, the I would tell you, would give you a very interesting framework about why, where our maps are deficient. Plants have a certain way of building a map, quote unquote, implicitly. Animals have a way of building their map, and humans have a way of building their map. Can we use Nyaya concepts of Bitark, Bichar, etc., to find, to, to, to basically see how we make sense of reality and how we continue to make mistakes? Because animals make mistakes, plants make mistakes, plants make mistakes and humans certainly make mistakes. The question is, Humans, I don't know if we can teach plants and animals, but certainly how do we teach humans to be more thoughtful? No, we can teach them animals. We can. Actually, you're right. We can even teach plants. Now that I have said it, I take it back. We can teach plants. Uh, may I add to what you just said? Three examples. I didn't want to that in the third example, that we like the reflection of light is almost perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. It's some, there is some silly problem there, but it's almost perfect. With ants, there's some noise. With human beings, yeah. Now, so that optimization principle, the stage three action principle of the truths, is working perfectly in the humanity. What's happening in the insect and the human mind and human beings? This is conjecture here. This is speculative. Happening is not the abilities. Happening is their the, the biology of plants gives them considerations other than optimal plants for the human. <laughs> and biology, the, the human higher faculties give them more distractions, more freedom, you know, more freedom. More freedom. And while well, the year over the uh, lifeguard might have stopped twice <laughs> you know. uh, So, so the, there's going to be a lot more noise. Yeah. Just conjecture. Yes. Yes. Falling up on it. Yes. But in the natural world also, when the light is there, the regime that the external conditions are stable. But if the external conditions create disturbances, the natural phenomena are all disturbed, just like it is in the human faculty. So the light follows that correct path when the external condition is stable. But let's say that it's very breezy. Then even the natural phenomena are disturbed. You still follow the model. So the body is disturbed. So, so that's what I'm saying. So what's happening in the human mind is that there's constant disturbance. Basis which we have some law, but that law is not as exact as the natural term. Yes. Because this is exactly when I teach communication, one of the principles that I teach my students is that what you think and feel and speak today will never be repeated ever because it's a non repetitive principle. It's a com more complex. Precisely, which is what I'm calling disturbances in the natural world. Mm -hmm. Any other observations? But I think uh, the thing that would be oh, sorry, any other observations before I try to keep the box and what she has said. The measurement will be different from other time you plus one. Because so there, no there will be change in heat, there will be change in particles. Then there will be change in so many things. Outside. Science always says that what we are concluding that is always the person. Due to due to different. Correct. And under controlled conditions. So the human mind barely ever is under control. I mean, while socially we are under control, inside 
I think so. Uh, it will be very powerful to distill some of these Nyaya concerns, not, not necessarily Nyaya theories, but methods, toolkits that Nyaya can use of concepts and uh, the way in which they have talked about errors, for example, all the different theories of doubt, error. The, in other words, giving us a way of how we engage with the world and form our opinions of it. If you think of the stock market, this is kind of, we're trying to figure out what will happen, you know, six months from now or a year from now. We're trying to make sense of the behavior of a lot of other sentient beings. And in that process, and everybody is doing it at the same time, and in that process, something emerges. Can we make it better? I think if we are conscious about what are the errors that are made perception at this stage, think about that a little bit more. We can come up with a theory of, uh, I don't know, error minimization, but <laughs> some theory. Interesting idea. Uh, I don't want to respond. You mentioned the stock market. I have to tell you everything and you don't get wrong. This is way back in the I was visiting with my set California history at that point. And my host professor, Charles, yes. he, he said, uh, Sham, we have an investment club, faculty investment club. I want you to come and give it. I said, sure. I used to teach him and see the stock market. I was in Mr. Chicago, part of the leader of the teaching markets at that time. And I said, sure. Prepared everything and took my slides, all the slides, and went to uh, at, at the meeting, which is the faculty club. Long table like this. Entered the space. Said my stuff. Associate professor. This table was full of the highest intelligence that I had ever been in a room with. In which you all on the world of that accidents. Physics, chemistry, mathematics, geology, you know, that. So you could tell them it's about stuff. Obviously, too late, can't back out by that time. So, start telling about uh, theory of stock markets and so on. And they start raising their hands. And uh, these smartest guys were big people recognized all over the globe in the expected things. Completely naive. They knew next to nothing about the stock market. They all had completely deterministic theories mm -hmm. about how stock market works and knew how to make money. So that's not what they did. <laughs> they did research in the lab. So, once I realized once. I go out to my own area, which I had studied. <laughs> so one quick announcement for tomorrow. We will, of course, start at 10, as we always do. But at 9.30, they will give us a tour of the place. Because I think we've not done that so far. Yeah. So we'll do a tour of the place tomorrow morning. A uh, lot of history was made here. So they shared with you some of the places where it was made, some of the photographs and some of the stories. So main for tomorrow, and then it will take about half an hour here, and then 10 o'clock we'll start. Can you sign some treaties that you want? Yes. <laughs>
And uh, I will give your indulgence a little bit. I have a very dual uh, presentation. Ultimately, we will cover it in Nyaya. That how Nyaya traveled from here to Europe. But it was not just Nyaya, a lot of other things traveled. And I wanted to share that with you. So it would take a little bit longer. So I beg your indulgence. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit longer. That's why we have that morning session to go into it. But hopefully, we will engage you because the presentation is quite big. Work. So you see a lot of forms that until a year ago, even or two years ago, I had no thinking about. I also share some things that I've been working on for a much longer period of time. And you see how we can link it all together and to uh, this uh, issue with Nyaya that we're discussing. I will also try and address, I was making some notes uh, about uh, institutions and how they were formed. I was not going to talk about that, but that is actually going to be extremely important because the problem that was solved in Nalanda was a problem that, in my view, almost seemed impossible. What the Buddha did, he created the Buddhist Sangha, is that he made for the first time institute, institutional formation that was not on the basis of biology. That is, you know, ants that are related to each other, bees that are related to each other, foxes that are related to each other, monkeys that are related to each other, princes or royal lineages that are related to each other, or families that are related to each other. We know how to transmit uh, behaviors using these. But prior to that, there was no reliable way of transmitting across non-biological um, entities. And so the Buddha created the first self-perpetuating corporation. And this is something that years ago. And Dalanda became possible by the Buddhists because of that. So I talk about the problems that he was trying to solve. Uh, and then you get a totally different because he was trying to do something that ought not to be possible in a free market economy, which is a university. The university is a highly, it's a contradiction in terms. It ought not to exist because it's trying to square a circle. And somehow the Buddha does it, and I'll talk about how he was able to do it. Why? This is the longest live institution known to man. So he, he did the impossible, but he did it in such a way that was so, with such finesse that. Uh, so it is never been equal. So I'll talk about that, all those aspects. Mm -hmm. It somehow seems to be huh? Sorry? No, 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 the university then, for mutual intelligence. Yeah, you can talk, we'll talk about that. I mean, there are Lakshanas that we talk about. Yes. <laughs> Properties. Properties of that. Yeah. We, we talk about Lakshanas and how to do it. 